In class three, um, this class is going to really focus on, on some of the different functional techniques for compression. So some of the things that I showed you or demonstrated just very quickly in terms of the musical uh, release times is really what the groove or tempo-based compression characteristics are all about. So in other words, when we take a song, um, in particular a song that is mapped to a tempo, so in other words, it was cut to a click track, and so there's a consistent tempo throughout. What we're really looking for is a release characteristic that has a musical value. Now, numbers to me were completely foreign until I started working in DAWs in the mid 90s. And um, because the analog consoles, while they had numbers sort of scripted uh, for the attack and release, they were just basically, you know, you got a smattering of numbers, like a couple of numbers here or there, but you didn't really know whether it was 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds. If you had a fast attack, slow attack button, like switch, you didn't really know unless you looked deep into the manual, like what the actual attack time was in terms of milliseconds or microseconds or whatever or this versus the slow attack. You just kind of said, does it sound better this way or that way? I like it this way. And then you would start to work with the release time characteristics. And the way that I would work in particular like an SSL is that I would take knob and I would kind of get a setting and it would just basically vibe it out. I would feel it out. It's like, wow, I can really control the sustain of how long that snare drum rings out and how long that kick drum rings out by adjusting the release times. And what I found was I would get these consistently very, very similar, if not the same settings if I was working on the drum kit. And then I would have my fast and slow attack set my threshold. And so I was constantly with the compressor adjusting the threshold at the same time I was adjusting um, the release characteristic and the ratio. So I would be kind of working with them together to try to figure out where does this thing live? Where, at what point does this thing really breathe and come to life? And that is what I call like, you know, basically groove or tempo based forms of compression. So it's really simple. I want the movement, if there's going to be movement, to be in musical timing. So if you had a guitar player on stage and the guitar player was performing, you know, and they're playing their notes. Now, if if it's a three-piece band, you know, and it's guitar, vocals, and bass, you know, and a vocal, uh, you know, uh, drums, let's just say, so a four-piece. And, you know, so there's basically, you know, uh, three instruments and, and a vocalist then the guitar player can be very busy and they can be much more dramatic and full and, you know, you know, really lay into things and be really dramatic with their level changes and all of that. But if they're in the context of a big band, then that guitar player may be just kind of very muted, kind of plinking, you know, through some chord changes, like basically comping chords is what they would say, just following the piano player and just basically keeping rhythm or timing. Or maybe they have a part where they're doing something that's a little more arpeggiated and rhythmic, but it has like a value that is very tight and tied in with the rest of the musicians. They can't stand out as much. They can't be as dynamic. They can't move as much. But that relative small movement by muting and clamping down and holding things is really important because it's that subtlety in how long they hold out notes and release and kind of move them that creates the relationship and movement with the rest of the band. In a live performance, that's much easier for a performer to do. They do it naturally. It's just like, hey, this is my place. I'm going to fit into this place, and I'm I'm just going to feel like my movement. Now, in all of that, when you put it into the context of a multi-track recording where these things aren't tracked the same way, sometimes that dynamic has to be built in, and that's the groove-based uh, compression technique. So whether it's a fast attack or a slow attack, the release timing um, what I have found like a very, very quick formulaic way to kind of make uh, something work like this is just by setting and calculating what those, um, not an REQ, let's go to a compressor here, uh, calculating what those uh, uh, delay settings are. So here, if, if I'm in an app like uh, Pro Tools here, I'm in grid mode um, and I want to look at bars and beats, I can actually zoom in on a uh, on a particular area here I can highlight what amounts to a quarter note okay so that's a quarter note and we could see that it's a quarter note right here if I show minutes and seconds it now shows that to be 521 uh, milliseconds 
So uh, eighth note would be half of that. Sixteenth note would be half of that. You could work with dotted values and things like that and triplet values. Sometimes that's relevant if you have a song that's in like 12-8 or something like that, or 3-4. We can get into some kind of triplet figures that, that actually have a swing to them. Um, but depending on the style of the music, usually just simple mathematical quarter note, eighth note, sixteenth note type of formulas for timings happen to work out really well. They happen to work out really, really well for almost everything uh, in terms of like pre-delays on reverbs, delay times for guitar solos and vocals and things like that. Musical values have to play some element here. Sometimes you want them to be a little more random, okay? And that's cool too. Or if you have a performance where the tempo kind of shifts, you know, it's not tied to a tempo, then then your millisecond rating is a little bit more relative, okay? You're not going to automate it to follow like the change in, in uh, dynamic of the song. But you are going to get something that is going to create a movement that has a feel to it, right? And that's so critical, right? So critical. Um, there are many forms of dynamics processing. Sometimes you just want to control the overall dynamic of something, okay, which is one of the first things that I set here. So what I would call like leveling performances. And uh, typically, um, if I were looking at waveforms here on a display and just pulling something out, like just, you know, kind of like, let me just pull out the bass guitar here. If I noticed that there were particular sections where the bass was maybe significantly louder than other sections, I would actually probably go to the original files and start by, you know, bringing them back in, reining them in. So maybe it's like the first chorus for whatever reason was recorded 3 dB higher than the second chorus. So I'll balance them out. So they're basically the same. Um, you know, while trying to preserve the basic balance. If something stands out like a particular note in an unusual way that's not musical, I'm going to back it off. And I'm probably going to do that in a manual way. It's a much more efficient way because really when you work from this point of view, uh, and this is dynamics processing on a manual level, I guess, where you control and gain, you want your compression to work more consistently. However, another way to sort of even out a performance is to do something uh, like a low threshold compression. And we'll get into, and there are many ways, and there are some compressors that are really, really good sort of what I would call averaging compressors. Okay, so here, like if I take this, I'm just gonna take this other compressor out here for a second. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna set like a really, really low threshold. And I'm gonna set a ratio that's very, very light with a, with a little bit of makeup gain here. And um, I can work with it. Uh, let me just kind of work with just a little. Oh, uh, I think that is, <laughs> I had it still, it was looping around that one note saying, boy, that's very mechanical sounding. So what I'm doing here. It's just like you look at it and it's like, oh, there's barely any movement. I'm just getting like 60 dB a gain reduction. But what it's doing is it's solidifying the sound, right? The consistency of the performance. More focused, more solid. That's leveling out a performance. Just something as simple as this, like one simple technique. There are many different ways to do it. Sometimes you just want to control peak energy to kind of level out a performance. Sometimes you want to work on averaging you know, out the performance, more like an RMS compression versus a peak compression. And we'll get into some of those basic things. So the idea then is more relevant to the attack and release settings. So peak or peak limiting generally is like in and out really fast, you know, fast attack, fast release, cut down on the peak, and then you can basically control it. So if that um, bass was maybe too clicky, like maybe there's a pick in there and the pick is making too much noise. You could do a real fast attack, fast release type of compression to kind of just kind of pull that in and and um, uh, make that kind of stick a little bit more closely to the rest of the sound of the bass. And then you can, after that, apply more of a groove-based compression where if you get the peaks sort of consistently 
in line with the RMS signal, then you can go to the groove-based compression with the slow attack so that the tr you let the transients back out. But now the transients, when they come through, are coming through at more consistent levels. So you don't have certain notes that stick out way too much. So the basic idea of this would be, um, you know, if I were to take this here, and this is not the best compressor. It doesn't have the fastest attack, but I could do this um, here with a high threshold and a steeper ratio. So this is really not the best compressor for this, but because I want something that's a little bit more transparent and this has a little bit too much of a color to it. But basically, and because the attack isn't like, uh, like perfectly fast and I can't get the release any faster. Um, what I really want to do here is just kind of cut down on what the attack is of the note. And if I can do so more consistently, then I can control and get that to be kind of more functionally, you know, balanced that leads into the balancing or tonal balancing or focusing compression of the overall performance. And then I have a compressor here that is gonna take the transient and kind of pump it out a little bit more. So one is basically cutting down on the inconsistent areas, controlling the peaks. The other is balancing the tone. And then the other is setting the instrument in the placement that I want. So sometimes these are different techniques that you can use. And maybe I'm not using the best tools. I'm just kind of using what's quickest here. But there are, are, are tools that are much more specifically designed for these types of techniques. And these are many of the things that we'll get into in this particular class. So we'll get into much more focused detail. And I'll be pulling out more tools that are specific to that, more transient controlling tools. And there's lots of really, really, really cool new stuff that's out there that um, uh, allows some more unusual control of things like that. So, um, and um, once you understand them, wrap your head around them, uh, you get the basic idea and then they're very easy and simple to apply. Okay, so that's uh, just to give you an idea of like some functional compression type of stuff. Uh, let's move on to class four preview.